What would you most like to change about cricket today? I'd love to. This is Manoj Badale. He is the lead owner of the Rajasthan Royals in the IPL and founder of the investment firm Blenheim Chalcott. We sat down with Manoj to discuss everything from how owning an IPL team works to their unusual player auctioning process. One of the innovations of the IPL was the auction. So literally we buy our players in front of each other. What's the strategy in planning session then? The build-up starts a year in advance. So it's not a planning session. It's a year of work. But ultimately, however much planning you do, the only thing you know is it's not going to be the plan. If you could sign or bring one player to the Royals, who would you like to have? Ooh, probably. Manoj, we are so excited to have you here. First, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, I'm sure you said that to everyone, but uh, but look, no, it's great to be here. It's great to be here. And, and by the way, amazing offices for those that don't get to see them. I mean, obviously, obviously getting paid far too much if you've got offices like this. <laughs> Let's just say, actually, do you know, venture and media are both good businesses. I think people actually are just generally very bad at making money from media. It's a skill that I acquired early. <laughs> Add sport to it and it helps a lot. So yeah. I think venture's great business for the for the GPs. Man, I'm I'm convinced well, it's a great business for the LPs. Well, well let's move on quickly from that. <laughs> um, uh, Man, I'm just, what, can I ask, when you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? I think the honest answer to that question was I was just always quite keen to make money. Um, you know, when you when you sort of grow up in an environment where there isn't money, you um, you know you're quite focused on that. And so I don't I don't think I had any sort of clarity. It was just you would just set yourself kind of short term goals and um, you know sort of go where the money was. Do you think we demonise making money too much? I'm glad you didn't read the schedule because it's totally winging that. But like I. I feel it's okay to say that. And actually, I like it when founders like, I want to make a lot of money. But it seems not okay. Um, actually, I don't know whether it's okay or not, but it was definitely a massive motivator for me. And I think it's just a very sort of simple metric that I suppose you you judge progress from. I mean, I'd like to think it was it, it's become over time a lot more than that. But you know, your question was when I was young. You know, that was definitely, definitely more of a focus. And your answer should have been, I still am young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be a lie, wouldn't it? So, can you um, can you tell us about that path to kind of achieving that then? So, I mean, really, from from very early beginnings into that education, and then the earliest forms of uh, forms of work. Yeah, look, it's an interesting question, but but I do think people sort of reinvent history whenever you know they've had a bit of success along the way. I don't I don't think there was a path. I mean, I think there were just lots of periods in your life where there was a sort of a goal put in front of you, whether it was um, you know, getting into a you know, a secondary school or getting a scholarship or a bursary. So you could go to that secondary school and then it's kind of so much of secondary school. And I think almost too much of secondary school is kind of geared towards getting in certain universities and then you get to that university and the peer group is more competitive, more able, and and then you you you're competing with that peer group to get into careers that are judged by the peer group to be the best possible careers. So, you know, I sort of look back on it and I think, you know, the positive was I've been very fortunate to been to have been in very um, informed peer groups that have driven you to good things. Um, the downside is that actually you look back at it and think, maybe I was too influenced by those peer groups and too influenced by what was the um, supposed right thing to do. But you know, it's a very conventional journey, right? So the school, um, university, consulting. Um, and I was very lucky in consulting to meet Charles, who you know, in many ways is much more um, creative and innovative than uh, I probably am. He, I think, had a much clearer ambition to be an entrepreneur, to own equity in a business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I sort of often look back on that and just kind of go, well, actually, if I hadn't met him, would I have been, would I have gone through that sort of entrepreneur journey uh, than I haven't? And, you know, that sort of Steve Jobs lecture, which we all talk about, I think 16 minutes, 49 seconds or whatever, the Stanford speech that he gave about connecting dots. One of my favorites. Yeah, well, but it is. It's an amazing speech, but you sort of have to listen to it two or three times, I found, yeah. to kind of really get 
what he was trying to say. And I think there's no path. What there are are lots of dots in front of you. And you try and sort of connect those in a way that creates a create short term paths. Um, so it's probably as a bit it's a bit of a sort of rambling answer, but I just I don't think there was any clarity at any point. It was just seizing opportunities that are put in front of you. I like that a lot because I think so many people hear of, you know, incredible success stories and think, oh, it was strategically planned from day one. And it's actually very disheartening to hear because most people don't have those strategic plans. And I'm with you. I always said, you know, to meet cool people, you have to go to the party. And it's like, you just have to turn over the next card. I was asked one the other day and it's like, to what extent would you say the success that you've had, which is immense, but is luck versus skill? I was asked this the other day, and it made me a little bit uncomfortable maybe to consider how much luck that had been for me. It's massive luck, right? I mean, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could split 100 points between luck and skill, but you know, whether it's 50-50 or 40-60, I don't know, but it's definitely a lot to do with luck. All I'd say about luck is the first point you made, which is you sort of have to be at the party to get the luck. And that's why... Um, you know, we've always talked about innovation. You can sort of, people talk about, you know, governments talk about innovation, big CEOs talk about innovation, VCs talk about innovation. Innovation is really just a series of sort of accidental collisions that take place where you put smart people in a room and conversations lead to other conversations that then lead to ideas that lead to, in the case of good people, doing something about it. And that's sort of how innovation happens. It's a bit like the conversation we were having before we came into the studio about being in the work environment, where, you know, the, the sort of work from home nonsense that that people still think is is um, is kind of the next generation of our. And it's nonsense, right? I mean, working from home is not a way where people are going to maximise their learning, where people, where companies are going to maximise their innovation where groups are going to be able to create bigger ideas than they could themselves. And it's a bit like your party comment, which is, you know, when you are in the office, when you're having those accidental conversations, that's when those bits of luck happen. I mean, I still look at my consulting career and I can trace it back to three or four lucky conversations that happened at certain times, you know, being in the office at seven o'clock on a Tuesday led the managing director to say to me, I hear you speak German, which was not strictly true. And I responded, as I often do, to things that aren't strictly true with an immediate yes. <laughs> and then I'm giving a pitch to Lufthansa on the Thursday, uh, but I get to spend two days with the managing director of our firm. And I probably learned more in those two days than I had in the preceding. Now, is that luck? Or is that putting yourself in the position to get that luck? I think it's where preparation meets opportunity is what someone once said to me. And I think that's very much the case. The one that really stuck with me talking about this was when, and I'm really trying to remember who it was, I can't. But someone said, it, I've been lucky, but it wasn't by accident. Yeah. And right. so to your point, is yes, you may have. No, definitely wasn't. <laughs> no, no. But <laughs> I was on, crap. it was on Asia. <laughs> I'm going to coin this in myself in a second. But I think the Any sentiment, the sentiment rings true. It Any does. wise thing that comes up, like, is that <laughs> I th I, like I think the real answer to your question, actually, which sort of pulls it all together, is it's always a combination of luck, skill or competence, and hard work. Right now, wh whether some things that happen are 33, 33, 33, or 50, 25, 25, it doesn't really matter. But if you don't work hard, if you don't put yourself in positions to get those bits of luck, and if you haven't got the skill to connect the dots, it's sort of unlikely to happen. Yeah. I remember I actually used it in my wedding speech. Really? Yeah. I've been lucky, but it wasn't by accident. <laughs> <laughs> must, have great, must have been a great wedding. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Um, <laughs> Sorry, you go. Uh, now, am I just, I'm just diving straight in. Outside, when we were talking before, you said that actually, you know, um, there are five characteristics that make buying sports teams, franchises, good business. Can you walk me through them? Yeah, that's tough because you've asked for five. Now I've now got to remember what five were that I was thinking of. But look, I think that the, the conversation we were having was, is sport a good investment or not? And I think for many years, sport was seen as a bit of a trophy asset for rich people along the lines of, you know, big houses and, and yachts. Um, and, I, and I still think in certain leagues and in certain contexts, that's true. But I do think there are characteristics that you look for, or certainly that we look for, particularly when we're investing in a sports franchise or a sports league. 
um, that helped make that decision. Now, number one is the value of the media rights because investing in sport is ultimately about investing in eyeballs. It's no different to investing in movie studios. You're sort of, you're making an investment in a product that you think is going to have engaged eyeballs. So assessing the value of the media rights is, is really quite important. The second thing about investing in sport is if you, if like me, you believe in business fundamentals, it's how can you make a profit? And to make a profit, there needs to be some control on your costs as well as exciting revenues. And control on your costs in sport means you're often looking for salary caps because where you don't have salary caps, e.g. the English Premier League, all the money that comes in the top where you've got massive media rights goes straight out of the bottom to players. So the beneficiary of those media rights are the players. So the second thing we always look for is sort of salary caps or some cost control. The other the other component of that is if you've got cost control, you've got you've got a level playing field. So you've got a chance of winning. So the Premier League, as much as we like to pretend it's a, a league of 22 teams, it's kind of only eight teams who start the season with any real prospect of winning it. And so that means there's an awful lot of redundant games, a bit like the Cricket World Cup that's just gone on. There's an awful lot of redundant games. And fans don't like redundant games. Of course, you like it when it's your team, but whether it's watching your kids play or watching sports at the weekend, you want unpredictable outcomes. And I've always thought the essence of sport is unpredictable outcomes. And to get unpredictable outcomes, you need a level playing field. And so the salary cap is important for cost control, but it's also important for that level playing field. And so therefore, the rigor with which that salary cap is applied is as important as the cap itself, as rugby found out. Um, Because it's easy to cheat. People with big egos and who like winning will find a way of cheating. Um, And that's where uh, transparent procurement comes in, right? Which is sort of a a long-winded way of saying, you know, the inability to cheat with the purchase of your players. Mm -hmm. And one of the innovations of the IPL was the auction. So literally we buy our players in front of each other, sat in a room, where in theory, which is live on television. So it's kind of difficult to sort of question how you got that player versus yeah. I got that player. Like we had an equal chance to get that player. You just bid more. Is there a cap on those bids? Well, there's a cap on the overall spend. Ah, okay. So it's, it's sort of like going to an auction where we've both got 10 pounds to spend and there's, we've got the same products in front of us, uh, all the same players in front of us. And we have to then think about how we're going to spend the £10 and how we're going to allocate that. So the point is it's fair. I mean, the Americans really pioneered it with the draft in the NFL. And in fact, they go even further in the NFL where if you finish last, you get first pick. So the emphasis is all on level playing fields. But this is this is something that is really the product of closed leagues. Right? Because if you well, have... Said, and that's the fifth characteristic, which is no promotion, no relegation. Because the minute you have jeopardy as an investor, you you have to discount the value. That was the fifth thing that attracted us to the IPL, which is um, there was no risk of spending tens of millions of dollars season after season and then suddenly being out of the IPL because there's no promotion relegation, um, which is the same as the NFL. So those are the now if you've got those five characteristics or these five attributes. A league slash franchise is very interesting to invest in. Can I ask, can you not turn the last one on its I mean, several questions, but turn the last one on its head and look at something like Wrexham and say, actually, yes, you can have, you know, uh, degradation of value or value you know, removal, but also value appreciation when they get promoted. Yep. And then it's an opportunity to actually have real, real yeah, scale to your investment. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, it's a great question, actually, because, you know, I think that sort of national league pre- uh, projection uh, sort of moving from the National League into the English Football League is is one of the few sort of remaining interesting investment opportunities in soccer um, because you're still at a level where the player salaries haven't got completely out of control and the prize for, for moving up and down is massive. So you're right, but you've just got to accept that the minute you introduce that, you perhaps... The argument for it would be you expand the reach of the game. So having whatever it is, 92 football league clubs and 
26 National League club means the whole country's engaged, but it does, you've got to accept there's a discount then on the value of the top assets. Can you, a lot of those five link very closely to, I guess, what makes the IPL and therefore your involvement in it with the Rajasthan Royals um, so interesting. But right at the beginning of that, you, you know, you've know you been involved from day one, right? So what were the conversations like in accordance with those kind of five points at the beginning when the league was in its foundation? You know, the temptation when you get asked these questions is to sort of sound strategic and smart, but that's not the truth, right? The truth is our involvement in cricket predates the IPL. So in 2006, um, Charles, my business partner, just got tired of hearing my ranting about the state of English cricket, the fact that the administrators in 2006 weren't seeing that there was this massive seismic economic shift from essentially England and Australia to India and this seismic shift from sort of long form cricket to short form cricket. You know, Charles has always been a big believer in, you know, you've got to be on the pitch uh, in metaphorical terms to sort of, so he's like, well, let's do something. So we actually, we had a television show in India called Cricket Star, which was like a pop, pop idol for cricket. We bought the commercial rights for Leicestershire and we tried to make Leicestershire the sort of team of the Indian eyeball because Leicester, the first city in the UK to have over 50% Asian population. And we created a tournament called the Champions League of T20 Cricket. All of them were reasonably unsuccessful. Um, uh, but all of them led to those accidental collisions and those creations of relationships and those crea that creation of a reputation for trying to innovate in the game. And then when the IPL came along, the IPL was actually supposed to start in 2009, but then India won the first ever T20 World Cup in 2007. And so the BCCI brought forward their plans by a year. But because of those early experiments, we were obvious people to call up and say, do you want to bid for a franchise? And so that's how it came about. And then obviously the was ticket- Was it an easy decision respectfully that you'd had those several projects which hadn't worked so well? Was it, it's easy to look back now and go, oh, that looks obvious, but- Yeah, follow. not at all, not at all. Because there were, um, firstly the ticket size for the fourth project, if you like, was a lot larger than the ticket size. Can for the how first much was three. it? Well, this was this was another thing, which was, um, of course, the the franchises were advertised at a price of greater than sixty million dollars. So ninety percent of India, ninety percent of the world, thought it was a sixty million dollar ticket. But of course, as soon as you read the prospectus, that money was spread over ten years and would be paid out of your. So what the number you actually had to focus on is what as you would when you're making a venture investment is like what what would the cumulative losses in the first three to four years be? Because if it's not working after three to four years, you'd hand the keys back. Mm -hmm. um, and that number was much closer to sort of worst case, sort of $15 million. Huh. Um, and so although the headline was, you know, Mukesh Ambani bought the Mumbai Indians for $110 million, actually what he actually risked was probably no more than $20 million. And then if you have multiple parties buying it, me and you buy it together, actually it's seven and a half. Totally, totally. So, which is what we did. So I put a consortium together. But back to your question, you know, was it obvious? Look, I think some things were obvious, which were cricket in India. Yeah, that check that box. Um, I think because of our experiments, we had real conviction that T20 was going to be the dominant form, dominant format. Um, and not everyone bought into that then. I mean, everyone does now, but 15 years ago, not everyone did. I think we had real conviction that if you had the world's best players, which they did, uh, that eyeballs would come. And I think we had real conviction that the media rights would be quite valuable. Reasons not to be so sure, the, th the number one on the list was, I was not sure, and I don't think we were sure, that Indian fans would become tribal in, in terms of teams in the way that English football fans are. Uh, you know, and, and I, I remember being at the semi-final in the first season when we were playing Delhi in Mumbai and Watson, 
who was our sort of star player of that season one, was bowling at Gautam Gambhir, who was an Indian superstar. And 30,000 people were chanting for Shane Watson. And I remember saying to Charles, wow, right, you know, tribalism has arrived. Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure that was going to happen because the super, the cricketing superstar in India, if you haven't been to India, I mean, a cricketing superstar is like a deity. And the idea that Indian fans would cheer against Indian cricket superstars, I wasn't sure about. That was one reason not to believe. Another reason not to believe was um, there, there had been no T20 in India. So, you know, T20 was not a format in India. Would the Indian crowd like the short form, bite-sized version, or would they want the longer form? That was another reason not to believe. And the other reason not to believe is there's always existential risk when you're investing in um, emerging markets as India was then. I mean, I just came back from India for the World Cup and saw a few of the games out there. And one of the games we went to was India-Sri Lanka. Right. In Mumbai at the Wankhede. And, you know, I had sent Harry videos of it. Um, it was unlike anything I've ever seen. And you look at um, that, you mentioned tribalism, you know, that, that absolute devotion to that Indian team. Yeah, yeah, and how everyone in the whole city, whether it's just the stadium, was was a, a snapshot of what that actually meant. It was incredible to see that passion mm. actually come through in, you know, a way that we're quite used to seeing passion in sports, but it's it's spread across so many different sports. If you know you're looking at this country or in the US or other areas, but this was so dedicated to one specific mm. asset and people involved in it. Every billboard was Virat Kohli or Rohit Sharma or Shubman Gill. And they're the superstars. I think them and the, the Bollywood. Um, I'm, I'm just intrigued I, in terms of applying it back to, I think the criteria three that you said, which was the auction process. And you mentioned Watson being the superstar. I've been thinking for the last like 10 minutes, what would the strategy be? Because if you had say 10 pounds, given the superstarization of sport that we see today, where players are bigger than the clubs, would it not be better for you as a business to spend nine of your 10 pounds on the one Lionel Messi or the one Pat Cummins, Watson, or is it better to have an overall good team? The answer's sort of in between, right? Which is, and that's what makes the auction. Uh, I, I think certainly in my sort of business career, the kind of most interesting business challenge that we've been faced with because essentially you're making three-year decisions because the player contracts are three years long. So if you, in round numbers, if you said that the salary cap is $12 million, you're making decisions about spending $36 million in not quite instinctively, but, but in the moment without the ability to do any more due diligence than you've done before you went into the auction room. And as well as deciding the value of the player, you've got to get that allocation right. And the reason your nine out of 10 doesn't quite work is you can't win a cricket game with one player. So if you're trying to win, there are 11 slots you've got to fill. And that means you've got to bowl 20 overs, you've got to bat down to number six or seven. So it's the allocation that, and, and then of course, we all know, we're all looking at the same data. We're all looking, we all know what slots we have to fill. And so the game theory for the economists here, you know, the game theory component of it is almost as interesting as the data analytics that underpins the asset valuation. What's the strategy and planning session then <laughs> before that? Because I'd imagine you have a cap, you'll target your players internally and you'll say, right, we'll go up to X. Yeah. But then if you maybe get that player for slightly less, is it a real time where you can shift quickly and go, well, we can put a little bit more yeah, we in tried somewhere to, else? Actually, we tried to unpack a bit of that um, ahead of the last big auction in 2000. And 22, I think the auction was 20, December 21. And we did a series of sort of YouTube uh, videos um, in the build up to the auction. And I think the first thing to say is the build up starts a year in advance. So it's not, it's not a planning session, it's a year of work. Um, and there are different components to that work. There's, there's obviously the data analytics that go on tracking players and tracking performance. There's the building of you're allowed to retain certain players. So there's decisions around which players you retain. And of course, depending on which players you've retained, that that means you spend, you prioritize your spend in certain areas. Uh, there's the game theory components of it. But ultimately, however much planning you do, 
it doesn't it it's a bit like planning in in real life in business the only thing you know is it's not going to be the plan and so you are still having to react in real time when as you say you know unexpectedly you bid you know one of your competitors bids an irrational amount in your mind for a player that you thought you would get you then have to switch to plan b yeah. plan c the international side obviously is huge and you mentioned having the best players in but one thing I love about the IPL is actually what it's done for Indian cricket by the cap of players that, uh, that you're allowed to have per team internationally. So like from your side then, I guess, does that increase, well, it increases the opportunity domestically, mm. but also does it increase then the pressure when you're actually looking at the international players on how you fit them into the team because you want the biggest names, but they have to then fit, as you say, the criteria that you know you need to meet. Yeah, I mean, look, there's different parts of that. I mean, th there's the straight supply and demand, which is, if we've got 10 teams in the IPL, there's four international slots, that's 40 international. There are m many more than 40 international cricketers who are good enough to play in the IPL. So that's challenge number one, which is which ones do you prioritize? Challenge number two is you're allowed to buy eight for your squad. So how do you maintain the motivation of amazing players who are going to play one or two games? So the example I, I used from last year is we had Joe Root as a backup batsman. Now, Joe Root is arguably one of the greatest batsmen that's ever lived. How do you maintain his motivation for seven weeks when he's a backup player, right? And there you have to do your due diligence on the characters of the players. In his case, you know, one of the most humble, nicest guys you'll ever meet. Actually, just thrilled to be part of the IPL. That's not true of all superstars. So the, the the psychological part of of it, that evaluation becomes really important, and and the last part is you, is it's a team sport. So thinking about the dynamics of the team and how certain players impact the dynamics of the team is another really important part of the sort of due diligence that goes on. Yeah, can I ask number one on the criteria was also TV rights. We hear about TV rights, but it's kind of one that never progresses from there. Who pays you? How does it come about? Do they just give you a check in the mail? Yeah. I'm really sorry, but it's one where I have no yeah, knowledge yeah, yeah. and it seems very black box. And is it equal distribution? Yeah, no, look, uh, firstly, I didn't say TV rights, I said media rights. Media rights. And, 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 and the distinction is really important, which is TV rights, I mean, as a generalization, are probably in decline. Um, and whereas OTT, digital rights, are booming. So, for example, in the in the very first IPL, I'm sim ex sort of simplifying for effect, but the TV rights were probably ninety percent of the of the value in the digital rights. Probably ninety five percent actually in the digital rights. Probably five percent. The last rights digital was the same, if not slightly more, than the TV rights. And I suspect in three years' time, it'll be eighty twenty in favour of digital. So. It's all about content rights rather than TV rights. To your answer about how does it get paid, yeah, no, I mean, that money gets paid to the broadcaster, to the league, and then we get a 7% share of that. So we, you know, every time our chief executive asks for pay rights, you know, I point out that actually we're getting, we're getting the largest parts of his revenue, of his revenue lines are actually literally just checks in the post. And the controllable part of the revenue line um, is probably 30% of our revenues. Is it equal distribution? Is it performance yes. related and equal distribution? Is it, is it, is it a bit of both. The vast majority is sort of based on your percentage share, which is equal. There is a prize, there is a position related component to it. Uh, if we, again, just kind of breaking it down, I'm just too interested when you think about like TV rights, is that by nation, where it's like Indian TV, you know, European? No, overall, overall. So the IPL, but I mean, the reality is in cricket and certainly within the IPL, sort of the Indian media rights are sort of 90% of the total. Yeah. And, and then when you think about digital, I think one thing that's fascinating with TikTok is I think cricket is either number one or the two most viewed i mean instagram we've seen already with clips that we've had many millions of viewers is social media the friend to the business of sport or actually do they create a lot of content that doesn't actually get monetized and attributed back to the owners look i think over time it's it's an absolute friend i mean whether social media is a friend 
to society as a whole. It's a sort of <laughs> very different we, question. We could do another podcast on that, but but to the business of sport, it's massive. I mean, it, it does a number of things. I mean, first, there's this concept of dual screening where most people who are watching TV or OTT or streaming are in a conversation or many people are in a conversation on social media with their friends about what they're watching. So you're effectively creating a second screen for advertising dollars to be earned. Secondly, you, you've got the sort of highlight component, right? Which most kids now don't, don't watch the actual game. They'll watch the edited bite-sized highlights and social media is an incredibly effective way of ensuring that those amazing moments get distributed. And the third reality is, you know, sport is a tribal, social group thing to do. And social media allows you to do that even if you're not with your group. And so, you know, whether it's the Wildstone Football Club fans who are spread all over the world, sharing the National League streaming and then discussing it on social media, that just wouldn't have been possible with a sort of um, analog TV world. When we look at the media rights from when you first bought the club in 2007, 2008 to today, how has it changed? Has it gone up 5x, 10x, 2x? Oh, you really haven't done your research, have you? Um, the, uh, the first cycle was actually 10 years and then it went up 5x and then it went up, went up 3x um, after there. So it's been an extraordinary growth. I mean, to the point where now on a per game basis, I think we're only behind the NFL as a sports league and it probably is the second most valuable sort of league in the world. If we're looking at them, yeah, you mentioned at the start when you had the values attributed to the franchises and you also mentioned in one of your five security and the value of that security. Yep. How over the 15 years now, and we've seen a few franchises change hands or you know completely change teams, how has that um, manifested itself within a kind of financial terminology? So if you wanted now to buy a slot, if you wanted to, to take a franchise over, what numbers are we really looking at to mm. do that based on what you pay from day one? Because one of the key things, again, we're always interested in asking is where does that, as we started off with, where does that value really come as an investment as well as obviously a passion piece? In the sort of language that you two are probably more used to, it was kind of what what is the fran what's happened to franchise values mm -hmm. over the last yeah. fifteen years, and and they've grown exponentially. And the best way to answer that question is, um, we had two new franchises two years ago, um, and the sort of average bid price. I mean, actually, the the headline bid price was sort of more like eight hundred nine hundred million dollars. Actually, though, that was again that ten year. That, that sort of ten year. So in reality, the sort of equity value, if you like, that was paid was probably five or six hundred million dollars two years ago for a brand new franchise. When you sort of discount the cash flows back and 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 sort of work it out properly, you know, the sort of conventional wisdom, if you like, is the franchises today are sort of billion dollar plus assets, and I think that's definitely true of um, you know the existing franchises and the two new franchises won't be far behind. Can I ask, at what point does franchise value plateau? Where's the asymptote? When the media rights plateau, right? I mean, it's it's all linked to the content rights. Because it's interesting, we had the CEO of the PFA on uh, uh, yesterday, and, and he was talking actually about kind of media rights actually plateauing in football across different leagues. They've actually decreased. Well, but, but again, I think you've got to be careful how you define media rights, right? Which is what I think he's referring to there is probably the sort of narrow definition of media rights, which is what do the broadcasters pay, right? But a bit like we were chatting earlier, which is sports franchises are digital content factories that are no different to movie studios, but with the primary differences being you don't have to pay for the script writers and you don't have to pay for the actors. And the other difference being you've got unlimited content. What you've seen, for example, over the last three or four years, is the rise of what they call shoulder programming um, or additional content. But, you know, I've, I've got, or we've got our players for seven weeks. They're playing 14 games. And so what the chap you're referring to is talking about the media rights for those 14 games. But what about the other content you can create when you've got those players with you? 
And that's everything from the social media content to the um, adverts that you create with your main sponsors, to the documentaries that you create behind the scenes, to the one-on-one -on -one stuff that you might create about a particular player. Um, you know, and all you've got to do is watch, you know, Drive to Survive to see how shoulder programming, right, a behind the scenes documentary has completely transformed the economics of a sport like Formula One. Unbelievable. Does that worry you as an owner though, where you see the um, transition from a player into a company where now they are so large that Lionel Messi is able to say to Apple, I'm having part of your revenue streams mm -hmm. and they're giving it willingly. Does that worry you that the transition of power is so great that players can actually eat into your economics? No, it's not, it's not that different, again, to sort of bring it back to the day job, right? It's not that different to when you're building a business, which is what we've been doing for 26 years, or building multiple businesses. You have to share the economics of your gain with the people who are helping you build those businesses. So if I said to you, is it weird? I'm starting a company and I've put a couple of million pounds in to start the business, but the management team have got 20% of the equity, you'd say, no, that makes total sense because then their incentives are aligned with you. They're going to work as hard as you're going to work to make a $100 million company. And if they get $20 million out of that, great. Like If I said that to you, you'd be like, are you mad not to do that? It's no different in sport. Why, like, why should it be any different in sport where the, 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 they're because already- Because they're being paid in some cases, multiple millions of dollars, whereas founders are paid often much lower than market value when they could be investment bankers, consultants paid substantially more. There's plenty of founders that have played multi, multiple mil, millions of dollars, at, especially you know West Coast tech startup. I think it's just a straight, it's a value question, yeah. which is if you're going to build sustainable franchises, whether it's in sport, whether it's in any other industry, if you don't share the value creation appropriately with the people who create the value, it eventually catches up with you. And, and actually, I think the really interesting question in sport is there are, in my opinion, two fundamental assets in sport, the players and the fans. And I think the question that hasn't been asked enough is how do you share the value with the fans? See, my question was, how do you share the value with the fans? But, you know, I mean, I mean it's, it's a bit like, you go, you go back to the social media question, right? I mean, Facebook is what Facebook is because of the engaged users. And I always thought Facebook would be, I mean, it's been an extraordinary success, so it's far be it for me to comment on it, but wouldn't Facebook have been even more powerful if there was some economic benefit for the people that produced the content that made Facebook what it was, because then the two would grow together. But that's, a, that's another podcast. But I think the same is true of sport, which is, and it's something we're trying to think through at the moment, which is all that matters is on-field performance, which is driven by your players, and engaged fans. And if you don't at some point start to share that franchise value creation with those two parties, it's going to catch up with you. Can you not do ownership sales with fans, a crowdfunding of sorts, yeah. a percent of the business, 2% this, and it may be relatively immaterial, but it's an ownership of some sort. Yeah, again, it's a really interesting question. And I, if you look at it, and we have looked at it, it's, it's there's not that many examples of anything desperately crazy. Like the Germans have a, uh, in the Bundesliga, they have, you know, fan ownership is uh, is 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 much more common. Um, but again, I've, I've always looked at that and wondered, is that driven more out of the sort of German obsession with worker representation on German companies? That sort of intrinsically um, sort of Protestant socialist kind of, DNA that drives a lot of that their sort of corporate structure thinking, or is that driven out of a belief that actually it's the Bayern Munich fans that are creating a ton of the value? So let's share the value. And the truth is, I don't know, but there aren't that many examples of fan ownership in sport. Not as many as you would expect. No, I, I totally agree with you there. Can I ask when you look across the the five criteria? What are the ones that are most often missing when you look at assets? When you're looking at new assets as a team, what's the one where it's like, again, they don't have salary caps? Well, firstly, there's not many leagues 
that have got you know what you would call massive TAM or what just massive scale, right? So Indian cricket. Like Was this the, why the English cricket failed? Because the TAM of UK cricket is small. You could kill me for that. You probably will do. Uh, actually, I mean, look, it, English cricket is ne- like there's no other country that can compete with the with the TAM or the size of the Indian market. The English cricket fan base and market size is plenty big enough to create an amazing globally competitive league. So, so that's not the issue uh, with what's happened in England. Um, but going back to the sort of original question, I mean, I think the the TAM's quite difficult to find. I think the thing that's difficult to execute is that completely robust, transparent procurement process. So there are many leagues that claim to have a salary cap but as we've seen this week with the Everton saga, the administration of salary caps, the administration of financial fair play rules, the regulation of that is really quite hard. And so the draft and the auction are the best I've seen in terms of, because fundamentally rich people with large egos who own sports teams hate to lose. So the psychology of that is they will do anything to get an edge. So the hardest part of making that, of those five criteria, is to police that. Does it worry you as an investor having an external uh, kind of uh, third party govern so much of the value in a business being, if they remove salary caps tomorrow, it's a free for all, you'd be going, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> Does that worry you? Again, it's a great question. It's actually a bigger question than even the one you're asking, which is so much of the destiny of different sports leagues, different collectives of sports franchises is driven by a relatively small number of decisions that the regulator uh, and the governor makes. So, yep, you do have to have uh, trust that economic rationality prevails, um, which is a little bit like investing in, if you've ever done it, investing in anything or doing anything in the public sector, mm-hmm. where you know the government changes the rule about rules about apprenticeship levies, and overnight that can make being an apprenticeship provider a great business or a bad business. Um, but that's that's the risk. I want to um, open Pandora's box on the sport a little bit quickly because. Oh, this is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, was that? I thought we'd be doing that far. Yeah. Well, well, we have, but this is... My questions were clearly this shit. Is, yeah. <laughs> you're, like, you're like this. I'm not sure. it's, it's cricket as a whole right now, and especially, again, linking to a conversation we had very recently, um, and something that Pat actually talked about when, when he was on here, when he was talking about the choice of tournaments to participate in and the challenges that he has filling or getting everything into a schedule. Short-form cricket versus long-form cricket. Now, moving everything forward as someone now entrenched in the short form game, but I'd imagine, and I'm jumping to conclusions, still with a love maybe for longer form cricket mm-hmm. as well. How do you how do you look at that general, I don't know if call it, well it is an issue, I guess, of, of trying to fit everything together, retaining the integrity of every format that remains, but also keeping that interest and business uh, sense present? Look, it's like everything. You, you, you've got to be crystal clear where the value comes from. I think sometimes with sport, we sort of lose sight of that. And, and value comes from customers. Right? In the case of sport, it's fans. How do you prepare for the future? You think about what the fans of the future want to see. And you make decisions based on what the fans of the future want to do. You don't make decisions based on what you want to do. So very often you'll hear the narrative around test cricket is, well, the best players in the world want to play test cricket, so therefore we should play test cricket. Now, with all respect, it th- that's a secondary consideration to what to the fans of the future want to see. Now, as you said, I personally love test cricket. It's my, f- it's my favorite um, form of the game, but that's not relevant to plotting the next 10 or 20 years. What's relevant is what are the fans going to want in 10 or 20 years' time? And the reality is people's attention spans are diminishing. 
The reality is people's you know, willingness to take five days off work and be in St. John's Wood is changing. Well, they can, they're remote. The, the, <laughs> <that's true. laughs> Don't get me started on that. Remote working um, from Lords is great. The, uh, you know, so, so as in any business, consumer, you know, consumer needs yeah. change. And you've got, to, you, you've got to ask yourself, what, where is that going and what does that mean? And as, as someone that loves test cricket, you know, I think, I think it, is, it can be, as we've seen this summer, an incredible format of the game. But we've got to keep asking ourselves the question, how do we reinvent it? What does the next iteration look like? What do we experiment with? How do we make it more appealing to the next generation? How do we make it more inclusive to the next generation? And if we ask those questions, and if we keep asking those questions, we'll keep evolving. And you know, one of the things we we hide we love to hide behind in cricket is we love this notion that cricket represents tradition, which I've always thought is a bit of an excuse for cricket represents no need for change. Yeah. And that you know whether it's Darwin, whether it's whoever you know who's been involved in any business, uh, you've got to keep evolving if you want to keep surviving and staying relevant. If you were looking at a county club now that you know institutions that are historic in this country in the sporting context what would you what would you do how would you start addressing that because they've begun with the evolution of competitions like the hundred and trying to add value you know add valued assets and and the ecb distribute some of that revenue to the counties which helps significantly but we're still a long way short probably from a financial perspective of making those counties long long long-term um sustainable businesses I might answer that question by saying, I tell you what I wouldn't do. And what I wouldn't do is take as a given where we're starting from. Right? And then again, that's, that's often the reality with, in business and in sport, which is the starting point is we can't move too far from where we are. And the minute you do that, you end up with compromised solutions because it's a little bit of what we know is right and then it's a little bit of, but we can't go that far because this is where we are today. You know, put differently, you have to start with a blank sheet of paper and say, where do we need to be? Because our competition is not ourselves. Our competition is other sports. Our competition is video games. Our competition is other forms of entertainment. So if we sort of sit in a bubble thinking, you know, this is about county cricket or this is about the future of test cricket. It's not. It's actually about the future of cricket. Uh, and it, and how relevant cricket is going to be in 20 years time and so you have to start with a blank sheet of paper you have to start with a holistic view of what you're competing against um, and you have to forget where we are and the problem with so many of the decisions that we make whether it's in cricket or football or rugby is their compromise their compromises there what can we get through the board what can we get past the 18 first class counties? What can we get past the administrators? As opposed to, you know, the IPL was a disruption. And disruptions are bold. They're different. It was a different governance structure. It was taken outside of the BCCI. It had eight teams in a country that had 24 Ranji Trophy teams. It was governed differently it moved at a different pace it had private investment it had a whole bunch of disruptive elements that were all driven from how do we make this as big as possible how do we make this reach as many people as possible and how do we make this uh, sustainable so interesting on the flip side i think that's that's a really interesting point the hundred right which is here seems probably the most disruptive thing that we've done in, in domestic cricket is it that disruptive? Because it's still essentially ECB controlled with the counties you know, associated with it. A lot of the governance will be controlled as a result of that, of, of the sport as well. And the most disruptive thing maybe is, you know, the the way that the game is played and changing the number of balls in an over or, you know, yeah, how, how the actual fundamental structures of cricket change. But is that actually, then is it falling slightly short? Is it missing the mark maybe to what you've just described as what made the IPL so successful? Because there's a lot of similarities in there. Yeah, look, I think the creators of the 100 and um, the people that have sort of run it should take an awful lot of credit. I mean, it, it's without question disruptive. 
I mean, whether it's the format, whether it's the number of teams, whether it's um, the sort of way the game is played, it's definitely been disruptive. There's no question about that. Second part of your question is really interesting, though, which is, but and is it as disruptive as it could have been? And is there more that it could be? I absolutely think there's more that it could be. I mean, does it have the world's best players playing in for the duration of the competition? No. How do we make that happen? Because we know if we get the world's best players, we're going to get even more engaged fans. We're going to get even more fans. Um, you know, is it of a format in terms of time in the summer that, you know, maximizes in stadia and media viewership? I don't know. But these are the questions you've got to answer. Um, and you've got to challenge yourself, I think, as as the people in privileged positions who are making these decisions to go back to what is it that's going to make this the biggest it could be possibly be, the most sustainable it could possibly be, and the most exciting and the highest quality that it could possibly be. And if you stay true to those questions, you broadly end up with the right answers. Can I ask you, you know, you said about obviously the importance of fans and fans being your customers and making it as big as it possibly can be just there. The interesting thing about sport compared to business is the connection between consumer and owner. For me, with the founders I work with, I'm like, speak to your customers, speak to your customers, speak to your customers. And there's this weird dynamic in sport, which is why we started the show, which is the lack of transparency on owners just being more open and being, I'm so grateful to you for being here, <laughs> but seriously, but actually just talking. And fans want it. They will love hearing from you. Why is there this opacity of ownership? I think there is a, which is not an answer to your question. There is sometimes um, a sense that ownership is a badge. Being a sports owner, owner is a bit of a badge. And, sort of something to aspire to. And so I, I actually sometimes worry about the opposite, which is sports owners thinking that it's more about them than the team. Um, I mean, the amount of noise around some of our football owners, and you know, it's like, it's not about you, it's about the team, right? It's like kind of good managers. You sort of, you don't hear about them as much as you hear about the teams. So. I get it, but I might shape the story. Like, you know, I, I sat down with Badad, but right, dinner with him from uh, Chelsea, uh, who obviously works with Todd. And I'm like, right now you're letting them shape the story. If you spoke, you could put your point across. Because there's a very strategic reason probably as to why you're behaving sure. as you are. Yeah. yeah, possibly. Look, narrative's important, but it's like business, isn't it? They always say business is about narrative, but, but ultimately it's about numbers, right? It's a bit like that with sport, which is sure you can shape narratives, but... The fans should rightly judge you, mm. ultimately, on your performance. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not so sure, you know, owners shaping narratives is... But it is interesting, is it? And, I, and I don't know, this isn't wrong, but linking it to that example, right? you, you've got people that come in from a financial background that are incredibly astute in their business. And what they've applied, if we're looking at a football thing, is changing the way that actually, let's say, assets are bought and then you know put on a balance sheet. And so the majority of that, that number that, that people read and, and they get is maybe the total number, as you said, similar to maybe the value of a franchise. Yeah. But the reality of it is actually, well, it's spread over X number of years. The real risk is attributed here. That's hard for the average fan to understand. I, and I wonder, is it important for them to understand it? Or actually, do fans of teams and organizations, do they just, you know, ultimately performance and, and winning is, you know, what it's all about. And that's really all they care about. Sort of double-edged sword. I don't know if that's the right metaphor. But, but the, the, what makes, one of the other things that makes sports franchises so valuable is there are very few things in life where you get such engaged customers and such engaged fans. For and so long as well. For so long. And so, you know, in sort of LTV terms or kind of traditional sort of venture capital metrics terms, that, that sort of LTV of a fan, if you capture them at the age of lifetime value, meaning LTV, you know, if you capture them at the age of seven, is, in, is incredible. And the engagement you get is incredible. Now, the flip side of that engagement is when things go wrong, 
there's an awful lot of emotion, there's an awful lot of irrationality, and there's an awful lot of uneconomic perspectives that are shared either in the media or on social media. But you sort of can't have both, right? You can't have, you can't expect and benefit from the emotional engagement that you get from your fans and then be upset when you get ridiculed in the media for making a really bad purchase. It's really interesting you said there about that and kind of the speculation that comes, especially on owners. We had CPAC Vucci who owns Boston Celtics and um, Atlanta on the show. And he said- one Today's time, a proper downgrade. <laughs> <laughs> no, we no, trust it. me, it's the first time I've had LTV on the show. I'm so happy right now. <laughs> um, but my question to you is, do you feel that pressure when there is media, social media saying, Rajasthan Royal should have done this, he should have done this. Do you feel that? And how do you protect yourself against that? Well, I mean, I'm not on any social media, so that's easy. And that, that part of the question is easy. Although, so so genuinely, uh, I'm not. For someone entrenched in traditional business and someone involved in sport, you look at how success can be recognized in traditional business and you can have multiple winners. You know, you, you, can, you can have a number of people playing the similar category doing incredibly well. You have that mindset, that's how you approach business. You then bring that into sport. And your role as a franchise owner is after each season, reviewing performance and ultimately there's one winner to the IPL. And everyone else has maybe fallen short. Some people may have exceeded expectations. But when you're handling those expectations of maybe a, a kind of a, a fan base against a customer in traditional business, how has that changed? Does that change how you have applied skills and mindset to business outside of sport and business in sport? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think you're the first part of your question where, where you talk about having multiple winners in business. You have multiple winners in business. It's very difficult to have multiple winners serving the same customer. So, you know, you can have, as we've been fortunate to have multiple winners in fintech, but, you know, modular doesn't compete with salary finance, doesn't compete with Liberis, doesn't compete with Oakbrook. They're doing different things for different customer sets in a different way. Sport's no different. I mean, by, by being a participant in the IPL, you, you can't have multiple IPL franchises, but having an IPL franchise opens the door to having multiple investments in the cricket ecosystem or in the broader sporting ecosystem. And so again, being true to what your investment criteria are allows you to make other investments, whether it's in other leagues, in other franchises, in other franchises, in other sports, or in other aspects of the sport that are consistent with your investment criteria. So I don't think it's any different. Can I ask, like, you know, I think the heat around like AI in particular is so large that it's largely uninvestable as a category right now, which is a bold statement that gets me a lot of hate, but, you know, I'm paid to be contrarian. Um, actually, being a venture investor, I'm just paid to be, as you know, the fees are real. Um, <laughs> uh, my question to you is when you look at, bluntly, the, the buy in price now for new sports leagues that we see generally, they're just so high. Mm. Is sports. And it's a very blanket, broad statement, but like, is sports an investable, good investment now? You know, I think the first part of your question about AI is interesting, which is, like, I don't think that's a true statement, that AI is uninvestable at the moment. I think what is true is there's a huge amount of hype around AI. There's a huge amount of hype around the infrastructure layer in AI. But does that mean you can't make money building vertical-specific AI-driven applications, not at all. In fact, there's going to be extraordinary wealth creation. So, and the same in sport, which is, I think you're right at one level, which is the cat is out of the bag in terms of the value of major sporting franchises in major leagues. So, you know, is that a place to be putting 95% of your net worth if you're a 25-year-old? Probably not, and definitely not if you're looking at the English Premier League or leagues without the characteristics I talked about. But that doesn't mean within sport, there aren't some amazing opportunities, whether it be social media platforms that are targeting particular user groups, producing content in a particular way, whether it's gen tech driven, AI driven news information that's 
change in the way the Bleacher Report used to make its money. So I come back to it, it's no, it's no different. Like, there's going to be a ton of money made in AI and an awful lot of money lost. And the money that's lost will be the people following the fashions as opposed to thinking through the fundamentals. And that's still the same in sport. And as sports, get, sports gets bigger, there'll be new avenues, new, niche, new niches, new media rights created that are going to be extremely valuable. With that in mind, what about your own sporting portfolio? Right now, it's pretty boring. It's, it is the Royals, but that's partly because for us, there's just been so much work to do with the Royals and you know the, the rate of growth has been so significant. So every time there's an opportunity, and we've seen plenty of really interesting opportunities, you come back to the question of, is it worth the distraction? And the problem is when you've got something big that's growing quite quickly, the hurdle for doing something else is quite high. But I do think we'll do other things in sport. Um, and I think we'll do other things in sport that are tech enabled. I think we'll do other things in sport that have got some of those attributes of sort of franchise value, uh, protection and creation. And I think that, that we, we, we haven't even scratched the surface on what data and tech is going to do in sport over the next 20 years. Can I finish on that before we do a quick fire and just ask, because I'm investing in this incredible data analytics platform for, for largely soccer teams. And they have LeBron, they have Messi, they have the best of it. There's like 10, 15 million in revenue. Like, it's an okay business. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Like, but they have just uphill battle resistance from owners, teams, to spend much more than 200, 300K on it. And I am shocked as an investor that owners who spend 80 million on a player would not spend a million dollars, two million, three million per player on the most intense analytics around them. Why are teams resistant to spend money on technology and data on their core players? I don't know, is the truth. I mean, you know, all I can talk about is our own experience, and we spend te we spend ten times the number you quoted on data and analytics, and our total salary. I have a company is, for you. <laughs> uh, our, um, and our total salary spend is about twelve to thirteen million dollars. So we probably spend. I've never thought about it this way, but we probably spend fifteen percent. Yeah, fifteen yeah. twenty percent. Wow, um, but that makes you a leader. I don't know if it makes us a leader. It, it means we have a point of view. Um, only time will tell whether that point of view is right, but. Uh, I, look, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think we all grew up playing fancy league, didn't we? We all grew up watching sport, having better opinions than the managers of our teams. And so again, a, just, I wouldn't overthink it. That's, that's part of the beauty of sport, isn't it? Which is, you know, I'm a massive Liverpool fan and, you know, I can pick a better team than Jurgen Klopp in my head. But of course, the reality is, of course, I can't. But that's what makes it so engaging. The bigger point you're making I think is interesting, which is it is interesting how very often sports owners do ignore the reasons for their success in business when it comes to sports ownership. And I've definitely been guilty of that at times. Uh, and the only way I've ever rationalized it is there is a sort of public visibility to the decisions you make. And to some of your earlier questions, sometimes subconsciously and even consciously, you can be influenced by those. But um, rationality and data-driven decisions are generally the right ones. Can we do a quick fire now? Sure. Can we say a short statement and you give us your immediate thoughts? What's the hardest element of owning the Royals? I think the public nature of it. If you could sign or bring one player to the Royals who you haven't had past and present, who would you like to have? Ooh, Vera Curley. What would you most like to change about cricket today? Could be the IPL, it could be English cricket, but when you look at cricket as a sport today, what would you most like to change? I'd love to m ask the question about have we got the incentives right for our administrators? Huh. Because sport is no different to business was it charlie munger that said you know the older i get the more i realize it's all about incentives and it's the same in politics right you know everyone moans about our politicians mm -hmm. rightly but it's all about incentive structures and if we could get the incentive structures right for our administrators we'd have 
I think it's a really interesting question as to whether we'd get better decisions, um, less compromised decision making, and more bold decision making. Which sport outside of cricket do you think has the most untapped investment potential? Ping pong. I mean, ping pong. I've watched a few days of TikToks and they're like, far, far. I'm like, what? They're incredible. What what I can tell you is, you know, I've had more paddleball, pickleball investment decks in the last year than any other sport. And when I go to Rocks Lane in Chiswick, you know, there's a there's a lot of people trying to get paddle courts. Yeah. So I think that would be the obvious answer. But generally, if that's where all the noise is, that's probably not where to go. Yeah, I think I think niche sports in quite large markets with very large engaged fan bases are quite interesting. And so that I'm not just stating the obvious, you know, an interesting example is handball. Right, so handball in Germany, in big parts of Europe, in large large parts of Asia, has the most engaged fan base. I know you're looking at me as if I'm from a different yeah. planet, yeah. but things like that, where you could create a global league, create a made for digital, made for broadcast property, relatively short time frames, lots of action. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, Yvonne Chinois, I'm reading his book, um, I think it's Let's Go Surfing, he's a, obviously a founder of Patagonia, he says high quality customers like highly specialized products. And I love that. And it's very much to that point. What's been the biggest investment mistake you've made and what did you learn? Oh God, too many, too many. I mean, Charles and I have been building businesses for 26 years. So, you know, we started a lot of businesses and, you know, we've made a lot of mistakes. I mean, the quick fire answer is generally people judgments. You know, you sort of look back at the things that you've got wrong and they... You gen- thought they were better than they were or you didn't see potential where they had it? Both. Both, you know, but but probably the ones that stick in your mind are the former. Yeah, it's really hard to get those right. You know, the, the, to, to consistently be right on people is tough. I think um, the importance of the execution stuff like we we both started life as strategy consultants but execution and um, and by the way i'm not particularly good at it but you know the cadences the discipline of 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 reporting the discipline of financials you know all the quote boring stuff is incredibly important and the businesses that do that well generally last for the long term and the ones that are run by you know t-shirt founders um, who think the rules have changed, the laws of fundamentals have changed. They kind of work for a while, but not forever. <laughs> no, my first time I was the CFO, I'm so with you. I just recognize my weaknesses. <laughs> I open Excel and it's like, sign in or register. I'm like, oh, fuck that. <laughs> but was, my final one was going to be, what is what, what would be in your eyes the most important discipline that you bring from that traditional business world into sports ownership? I don't think there's a single discipline. I think what we've tried to do is all the things that have helped that we've learned at Blenheim Chowcott. We've tried to bring all of those in. So whether that's approach to hiring, approach to um, reporting, approach to evaluation, approach to cadences, the use of technology, the use of data, um, making decisions with sufficient cognitive diversity in the room, um, regular board meetings, you know, and, and actually every time we've sort of gone astray, it's because we've let those principles drop because we're quote different. So there's so many, I, I you know, I, I genuinely think actually, um, you, 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 you want to treat it no differently to any other business. So just as like an extension, you mentioned that's, you know, twice if, if something's maybe done differently or you've let something slip from how you would normal, normally do it. Is that because there's an element of passion and fandom in your ownership that you don't have in traditional business? Always, anytime you make a mistake, you know, it's either ego or passion or impatience or sort of urgency that may or may not be there. So, you know, or allowing certain people to influence things too much. So just any time you deviate from process, there's a risk. Final one from me. What's been the biggest highlight 
like the moment in terms of owning the Royals where you're like, I remember that and I'll always remember that. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it's on kind of Warney's autobiographical film, so I can't really pretend, but it, you know, look, winning that first season was extraordinary. You know, unfortunately, it hasn't happened for another 14 years, but um, yeah, that, that, you know, that nothing beats winning um, and nothing beats winning in front of large numbers of people and particularly when you've become the story of the tournament, uh, as we did in 2008, that was that's hard to beat. Having won that first one, was it just, we, did you have a moment standing at the end going, you know, first iteration complete, champions? Yeah, no, I Shane think- Shane Warne in there, you know, yeah, yeah. what a- Yeah, no, I think, I think um, much to my wife's disappointment, I described it as the best moment of my life, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's, uh, which obviously not true, second best moment, but, uh, or, actually I should say fifth after the three kids. Um, <laughs> Got there but yeah, no, look, it's, um, it, 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 that's the other thing you must never forget, which is, it's a massive privilege to get to do these things. And therefore, yes, you must enjoy them, but you must never forget that it's a massive privilege. You know, enjoy the good times, but whenever you're good, you probably haven't been as good as you think you've been. And whenever you're bad, you probably haven't been as bad as you think you've been, so. I'm never allowed to say things, but I always say them anyway. This has been my favorite show. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, A, it's the first time LTV's been said in a show, <laughs> but B, it's like real granular. It's been fantastic, I've loved this. We're getting to know each other well and how we do it. And I know the minute, the, the level of business, the opportunity to talk about everything. Oh, it's easy, yeah. I, could, I just yeah. knew. You'd well, look, we've got to get you over to uh, to White City and show you the Scale Space Campus, I but um, you know. Good luck with what you're doing and uh, it's been really enjoyable actually. Great Thank questions. You so much.